Good morning, and welcome to The Global Current. I'm Alex Krause. And I'm Dominique DiMarzio. In news, North Korea allows women's march across the DMZ. Iran negotiates nuclear energy with the West. Terrorist attacks at a Kenyan university leaves 150 students dead. In analysis, Greece demands billions in World War II reparations from Germany. China, Japan, and South Korea resume talks on containing North Korea. The implications of Nigerian President Jonathan's loss in recent presidential elections. And the Global Current sits down with Kayvon Afshari of the American-Iranian Council on recent nuclear negotiations, the threat of ISIS, and Yemen's recent upsurge of violence. Thanks for tuning in, and enjoy the show. And now, Samantha Stevenson reports on a women's march allowed across the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea. On Friday, April 3rd, North Korea approved the Women Cross DMZ march, led by feminist activist Gloria Steinem, along with May Reed Maguire and Lema Bowie. Both May Reed Maguire and Lema Bowie are recipients of the Nobel Peace Prize. May Reed Maguire received hers in 1976 for founding the Northern Ireland Peace Movement, and Lema Bowie was awarded in 2011 for her work in ending Liberia's civil strife. The DMZ, or Demilitarized Zone, is one of the most dangerous places on Earth. According to The Guardian, it is the world's most fortified border, with North and South Korea still technically at war. The zone is heavily mined, with thousands of soldiers facing off on both sides. As co-organizer and head of the Women Cross DMZ, Steinman says, it's hard to imagine any more physical symbol of the insanity of dividing human beings. In an op-ed for the World Post, Christine Ahn, co-founder of Women Demilitarize the Zone, wrote, Why are we walking? We are walking to invite all concerned to imagine a new chapter in Korean history, one marked by dialogue, understanding, and, ultimately, forgiveness. We are walking to end the Korean War by replacing the 1953 Armistice Agreement with a permanent peace treaty. And we are walking to ensure that women are involved at all levels of the peace-building process, including at the peacemaking table when that historic treaty is negotiated and finally signed. The planned day for the walk is May 24th, which is also International Women's Day for Peace and Disarmament. Neither South Korea nor the United Nations have given their approval. This is Samantha Stevenson for The Global Current. Safiya Tarasad reports on Iran's nuclear talks with the West. Iran and world powers made history last week with the signing of a breakthrough deal on Iran's nuclear program. After years of tensions between Iran and the United States, this still presents great hope for the future of nuclear, non-proliferation, and straightening of Iran's relations with the rest of the world. According to CNN, this is a win-win situation for all parties involved. The agreement's key points include a limit of 5,000 uranium-enriching centrifuges, a limit on the percentage of uranium enrichment, a stipulation that Iran cannot be less than one year away from producing a nuclear weapon, and clearance for UN inspectors to have access to Parchin, an Iranian military base with ties to the nuclear program. In return, economic sanctions against Iran will be lefted by Western nations. The Guardian reports that Iranians took to the street to celebrate the end of the economic sanctions and isolation. After the past 36 years and Iran's strained relations with the Western world, the New Deal will be the window to the outside world Iranians have been craving for decades. Speaking on the historic agreement, President Obama reiterated his willingness to engage with Iran. We are willing to engage you on the basis of mutual interests and mutual respect. This deal offers the prospect of relief from sanctions that were imposed because of Iran's violation of international law. Going forward, Iran-U.S. relations have the potential to improve if Iran adheres to the stipulation outlined in the deal. This is Safiya Tarasad reporting for the Global Current. Mallory Finch reports on the recent terrorist attacks at a Kenyan university, leaving 150 students dead. On April 2nd, early on a Thursday morning, al-Shabaab militants fired at students on Garissa University College in eastern Kenya. According to the Washington Post, the attack killed 147 and wounded 79 more. Four of the Somali militants were also killed. The Washington Post reports that students remained unaccounted for after the attack that left the university campus in chaos. Rosalind Mugambi, who was asleep during the attack, woke up to the sound of gunfire and ran from her dormitory while bullets whizzed by around her. Students had previously expressed concern over the threats the university received back in December. An al-Shabaab spokesman stated that the militants were purposely holding Christians hostage. This is the worst terrorist attack in Kenya in over two decades. The president of the university addressed the public on the attack. 
this is a very sad day for Kenya. Uh, the terrorists were able to kill young, good citizens very early in the morning before the operation started. And as I speak to you, it is suddenly that we lost 147 lives. April 2nd was the worst terrorist attack in Kenya since 1998 attack on the U.S. Embassy in Nairobi. The 1998 attack killed 224 people. Since an attack on a mall in Nairobi in 2013, the U.S. military has carried out drone strikes against the leaders of the Al-Shabaab group. Kenya's military presence on the border of Somalia protects Kenya's economic interests and stabilizes the border. Al-Shabaab attacks have previously attacked churches, buses, and hotels. The militants say they will continue the attacks until Kenya removes military forces from the border. This is Maui Finch for The Global Current. And now, Karina Taylor discusses the implications of Greece's demand for billions in World War II reparations from Germany. For many months now, worldwide media has followed Greece's economic struggle as it battles to remain both solvent and a part of the Eurozone. To secure new loans, the EU, led by Germany, have demanded continued austerity measures in Greece. Earlier this week, Greece changed the conversation from its fiscal future to its wartime past, presenting a demand of its own. According to the Greek government, their country was never compensated properly for its suffering during the Nazi occupation in the Second World War. They are now claiming Germany owes nearly 279 billion euros, or $305.17 billion, as Reuters reports. Is World War II really to blame for what The Telegraph notes is nearly half of Greece's public debt? According to the BBC, The Guardian, Reuters, and Euronews, the facts are these. In 1941, the Axis powers occupied mainland Greece. Thousands of civilians died as German troops moved through the mainland and others were killed during the course of the occupation. The Greek government was drained of millions to fund the Third Reich's occupation and military activities in North Africa. In 1960, West Germany paid Greeks victimized by the war 115 million Deutschmarks. In 1990, the treaty allowing German reunification absolved the Germans from making further reparations. Greece now desires war crime relief from Germany that would serve as a reduction of its repayment of a joint EU-IMF bailout of 240 billion euros from 2010. This accusation comes at a critical time for Greece's economy. The Telegraph reports Athens is attempting to release 7.2 billion euros in bailout funds the country desperately needs to stay afloat, and newly elected Prime Minister Alex Tsipras has been attempting to renegotiate the debt crisis since assuming office. The fact that the Greek government chose to bring these demands to the table four weeks before they are expected to pay 700 billion euros to the International Monetary Fund is not lost on European Union members close to the deal. Germany's economy minister, Sigmar Gabriel, bluntly told the BBC, To be honest, I think it's dumb. I think that it doesn't move us forward one millimeter on the question of stabilizing Greece. If this were a question of stabilization, the minister would be correct. However, Greece's current political climate reveals a people less concerned with how massive loan payments constrain them fiscally and more concerned with how public dissection of their economy has diminished their national profile internationally, especially in the eyes of their fellow Eurozone members. The recently elected Syriza government rode a wave of anti-austerity sentiment to power earlier this year with slogans such as hope is on the way and promises of significant moratoriums on debt payments serving as a central tenet of the coalition party's economic platform, according to the BBC. This latest reparations claim comes from the office of Popular Finance Minister Yanis Varoufakis, a career economist that protested the bailout and encouraged the previous government to default before his election. In a 2011 TED Talk, Varoufakis painted a dire picture of the economic crisis' impact on the EU. What we hear about the centralized disposal of national assets, particularly of the Greek kind, the loss of national sovereignty as a price we have to pay for this fiscal union, and, of course, the dreaded treaty changes that have to go through 27 parliaments and or electorates. I submit to you that this is both unworkable and undesirable. More recently, Bloomberg reported him comparing the Eurozone to the Hotel California in the Eagle song, a place where you can check out at any time but you can never leave, a rather dramatic, if confusing, way of saying a Greece in default would not necessarily have to be a Greece without the Euro. Put simply, within Greece, this is not a question of stabilization. It is a question of responsibility and how heavily past sins should weigh on future relationships. This might sound ironic to Greece's creditors. The Telegraph quoted Bundesbank chief Jens Wiedmann declaring the new government has gambled away a lot of trust. But it appears that in a time of instability increasingly interpreted as purposeful international humiliation, the Greeks have turned to the past for catharsis. 
This is to be expected of a nation widely accepted as the birthplace of Western civilization, but their focus on past wrongs instead of past triumphs is troubling for the state of the Eurozone. The European Union, with its central parliament and single currency, is supposed to be an organization that looks toward the future, creating a firm distinction between Europe's present-day pursuit of community and the violent turmoil of the past hundred years. By making this reparations claim, Greece is attempting to place a decidedly 21st century issue in a 20th century context, and in doing so calls into question Europe's ability to play host to states that are truly in communion with one another. One of the current government's campaign pledges, according to the BBC, was to pursue a European debt conference modeled on the write-off of half of Germany's post-war debt. Despite this attention to recent history, their attempt to reframe the populace's discontent as a result of residual trauma does not resemble Germany after the Second World War as much as it does Germany after the First World War, a country facing harsh regulation from exterior forces, a government elected to push back against those external pressures, and an international community expecting acquiescence rather than rebellion at such a crucial moment for economic recovery. Had this been 30 or even 20 years ago, this accusation may have gained more international traction. However, in a world where Germany's profile has risen from the symbol of dysfunctional Cold War politics to the major engine behind the European economy, it's harder to imagine the world holding the present government responsible for past mistakes, especially considering the source of the allegation. In attempting to shift responsibility, Greece has ignored this normative change and may find itself with the same crippling debt, but with a creditor that has now lost all patience after being blackmailed with its past sins. This is Karina Taylor reporting for The Global Current. Vaughn Rogers analyzes the resumption of talks between China, Japan, and South Korea on containing North Korea's nuclear program. Chinese, Japanese, and South Korean ministers met in Seoul on March 22nd to discuss and schedule three-way talks. The discussions are hoped to boost cooperation among the three states, including such endeavors as bringing North Korea's nuclear weapons program to a halt. The New York Times points out that among the topics discussed, the most urgent issue was stopping the North Korean weapons program. China has been a staunch supporter of North Korea since 1950, when North Korea invaded Seoul. China even allowed North Korean air bases on Chinese soil. In light of North Korea's most recent and arguably embarrassing gaffes, China has appeared more as a parent rather than a colleague. This historical glimpse shows why these three-way talks are so important and rare, especially considering the talks were stopped in 2008. China had been the leader of East Asia for centuries, until the 20th century to be precise, collecting tribute while in return providing education and protection to other states. Japan had invaded Korea on a handful of occasions throughout history, including in the 20th century before the Second World War. Shortly after World War II ended, North Korea invaded the South. China has since then assumed a teacher role for North Korea as it built up its communist state, but China has recently become frustrated with its petulant behavior. For example, when Chinese Prime Minister Xi Jinping explicitly wrote a letter to Kim Jong-un stating, do not launch a ballistic missile, which the North Korean dictator did anyway, albeit a gross failure, China's message was thoroughly ignored. If powerhouse China is unable to sway the North Koreans from launching a ballistic missile, how can North Korea's nuclear program be stopped? Most countries are skeptical that North Korea does have the capability. However, North Korean ambassador to Britain, Hyung Hanbong, asserts that his country is ready to attack at any time. Well, if the United States strike us, we should strike back. We are ready for conventional war with conventional war. We are ready for nuclear war with nuclear war. East Asia is seeking stability and security, such as with the newly formed Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and will need to quell the tempestuous North Korea in order to do so. If China were to help stop the North's nuclear program, it would mend relations with the South, as well as with Japan. It could also help make or break the latter country's decisions to join AIIB. Cooperation between Asiatic countries has been difficult to achieve in the most recent years, but this could be the soft power and soft negotiating needed to bolster relations and foster stability in the region. In addition, South Korea's Foreign Minister Yoon Byung-se, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi, and Japanese Foreign Minister Fumio Kishida all issued a joint statement saying that they wish to reopen six-nation talks to stop North Korea's nuclear weapons program, the other three being Russia, the United States, and North Korea itself. The significance of holding these talks now is further heightened by the fact that China and South Korea canceled meetings in the last few years following Shinzo Abe's visit to a Shinto shrine that honored several war criminals. This is Vaughn Rogers reporting for The Global Current. Liza Bell discusses the implications of Nigerian President Goodluck Jonathan's loss in recent presidential elections. On March 28th, Nigerians finally turned out to vote for the presidential election. 
The presidential elections took place six weeks after the intended date. The Independent National Electoral Commission stated that the election was delayed because the military forces were sent to fight against Boko Haram and would not be able to provide security during the elections. Previous elections in Nigeria have been witness to violence and vote rigging. However, this year, the only problem encountered was a delay in announcing the results to account for late ballots and car readers that did not identify the fingerprints of voters. Meanwhile, some Nigerians argued that the delay was simply a political move to spend more time rallying for support of incumbent Good Luck Jonathan. In an interview with Press TV, University of Abuja, Professor Abu Bakar Umar Kari had this to say. In the build-up to the postponed February 14 and 20 elections, all forecasts were unanimous. There was a consensus that the PDP was going to lose the election. So perhaps they want to use the six weeks period to recover. On April 1st, the Nigerian Electoral Commission announced that former military ruler Mohamedou Buhari won the election. The concession by Jonathan to Buhari shows a peaceful transition of presidential power in a country plagued by electoral corruption. There was overwhelming support for Buhari throughout the states in Nigeria. For instance, in the state of Kano, 1.9 million votes were cast for Buhari and 215,800 for Jonathan. The results of the election proved that Nigeria is in need of change. Nigerians are optimistic about change amid security and economic concerns under Good Luck Jonathan's presidency. As mentioned earlier, vote rigging was a major concern in Nigeria's election. According to the BBC, in 2007, the presidential poll was not credible, and in 2011, despite better run elections, there was still rigging. In the effort to minimize corruption, the Electoral Commission for this year's election utilized biometric voter cards to prevent vote rigging. President Jonathan and his party also lost control of many vital states prior to the election. As a result, Jonathan did not have control of the electoral proceedings there. While campaigning for this year's election, Good Luck Jonathan also had to manage the situation with Boko Haram in northeastern Nigeria. Jonathan was criticized for not doing enough to end the conflict. Like in any election, the economy plays a huge role in whether or not the incumbent will be re-elected. Even though Nigeria is the largest economy in Africa, half of the population still lives below the poverty line. Nigerians see the People's Democratic Party, the party President Jonathan leads, as corrupt, which has not helped his case. Overall, Nigerians have seen the PDP in power since the late 1990s and feel the need for political change. According to the New York Post, on April 1st, spontaneous celebrations sprang up across cities in northern Nigeria. Hundreds of the youths chanted, change, 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 and drivers honked car horns in support. Asked by Press TV why she voted for Buhari, one Nigerian voter had this to say. Our children, they finish uh, secondary school, university, graduate, no work, nothing, no work. We are suffering. Ultimately, Nigerians were unhappy with their leader and put their faith in a democratic system that has heard them and their need for change. This is Liza Bell reporting for The Global Current. Finally, The Global Current sits down with Kayvon Afshari of the American Iranian Council on Iran's role in nuclear negotiations, the fight against ISIS, and Yemen's recent upsurge in violence. Today I have Kayvon Afshari, the Director of Communications from the American Iranian Council. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Now, last week, the P5 plus 1 and Iran have agreed to a basic framework after going over the original deadline in Geneva, and the agreement will not be written until June. Do you think this deal is a success? Uh, well, Daniel, I would say it unequivocally is a step in the right direction. However, I'd refer to it more as a limited success rather than an outright success because, you know, there's a lot of people who still want to scuttle this deal, both in Iran, in the region, in the Congress, that still need to be brought on board in order to support it, in order for it to be a sustainable deal. The real test is going to be whether or not they can come together to sign on the comprehensive deal, which right now has a self-imposed deadline of June 30th. First, if they can sign that deal, and secondly, if they're able to actually deliver on those commitments or if they get caught up on the details. For example, the detail coming out now that as a point of contention is over the sequencing and the timing of the removal of the sanctions. So, yeah, I would say it's a step in the right direction, but it's really a limited success rather than an outright success. In your opinion, what would make it an outright success? Well, the factors that I laid out just now, I mean, those are the steps that need to take place. They need to obviously sign the comprehensive deal, but more importantly, they need to actually be able to deliver on their commitment. So meaning, you know, obviously Iran will have to have verified reports from the IAEA that is operating by all the measures they've agreed to to ensure that its nuclear program is entirely peaceful. 
And at the same time, the U.S., EU, and the U.N. Uh, will need to deliver on sanctions relief to, on all the nuclear-related sanctions. Right now, what I was referring to earlier is that there are differing interpretations of how that sanctions relief should be sequenced. Uh, in Iran, the Supreme Leader is demanding that, and others are demanding that sanctions be removed as soon as the deal is signed, basically, whereas in the U.S., they're saying that sanctions will only be removed you know, simultaneously with or in tandem with IAEA verifications of uh, entirely peaceful purposes. A comprehensive solution to this nuclear issue is a necessary but insufficient variable toward a broader U.S.-Iran rapprochement, which is something that I have worked for and that the American-Iranian Council has worked for for a long time. And if your listeners go to www.us-iran.org, they'll see more of the work that we're doing and find out some of the history of the AIC and everything it's done to actively pursue a U.S.-Iran normalization of relations. Now, while the talks were going on in Geneva, some in America have said that the U.S. came to the table desperate for any kind of deal. Do you believe that is the case? No, I don't think so at all, really. I think that the U.S. approach really stems from Obama's 2008 campaign in which he made a very clear case that Iran is something that he wants to make a very high priority. Aside from health care and immigration reform, Iran was a big goal for him, something he really wanted to pivot away from the Bush administration era approach. You know, he conducted interviews and really said that he wants to engage in, like, you know, aggressive personal public diplomacy. Uh, so that was really the, the root of the new U.S. approach. But, um, we also have to take into consideration the changes in Iran from the last election also. I think the replacement of Ahmadinejad with Hassan Rouhani made a big difference, especially in the optics of it all, because it would have just been very difficult for the U.S. to publicly engage in uh, bilateral diplomacy with the Ahmadinejad administration, which had just you know, engaged in a bunch of things that Americans and many others found extremely distasteful at the U.N. stage and elsewhere. So having Rouhani in there, I think, made it a little bit more palatable. But more broadly, I think that the shift is not about the U.S. becoming desperate for a deal. I think it's that after 36 years of coercive policies towards Iran, everything from sanctions to targeted assassinations to cyber warfare to supporting Saddam Hussein during the Iran-Iraq war, so a lot has been done to try to coerce Iran towards what the U.S. wants. I think that the Obama administration came to the realization that rather than continue to try this entirely coercive approach, they would try something else in their toolbox, which in this case was diplomacy, uh, was direct bilateral engagement. So what we're seeing now is really the fruits of that diplomacy taking place. And it is a very difficult process. There's a lot of people on the sidelines who don't like the form that it's taking. So they want to kind of scuttle this deal. But I think it has much more to do with that shift in U.S. strategic thinking towards Iran, as well as, as I mentioned before, the change in administration in Iran in 2013. Because, you know, there, there were secret talks between the U.S. and Iran under Ahmadinejad for a couple years. But I think that with the change in the administration, it became more palatable for these talks to go from private backdoor into public talks. Now, let's kind of flip this question to the Iranian side. So with um, Iran wanting to be free of these sanctions, they came to the table. Did they come out of some weakness or desperation? <laughs> kind of going off the same question with the U.S., but more of like the Iranian side of this. Sure, I understand. Um, I think you want to get at what are, kind of, what are the incentives for Iran to engage in this diplomacy? First, in terms of sanctions, especially the banking sanctions, which have kind of cut Iran off from international banking, certainly have hurt. It's not that they haven't had any effect. I think they are affecting the government. They're also affecting ordinary Iranians, unfortunately. That being said, I don't think it is the sanctions that are bringing Iran to the table out of a position of weakness or desperation to just get the sanctions removed. I think there's a couple of facts that indicate that that's not the case. First, I mean, if you just look at the negative correlation between increasing sanctions and increasing centrifuges, each time the U.S. has increased sanctions, and the real ratcheting up of the sanctions actually took place under Obama, not under Bush. It was the Comprehensive Iran Sanctions and Divestment Act that Obama passed under his first term that really did ratchet up those sanctions and have done more harm to Iran. But even as those sanctions increased, Iran continued to expand on its nuclear program. So that is to say that there's a positive correlation to increasing sanctions and expansion of Iran's nuclear program. So that's the first thing that, that tells me sanctions don't seem to have been working if you look at the historical record. 
at the same time, I think that, you know, if you look at, you know, these talks have been going on for 10 or 12 years or so, first with the EU and just the U.S. on the sidelines. And Iran was negotiating and offered certain concessions at that time. But they obviously were not fruitful. They didn't end up at an agreement at the end. I think that what has changed here, what allowed Iran to engage more proactively in this negotiation process was a change in thinking on the U.S. part from demanding no enrichment, which was their position for a long time. And there's a lot of Americans who are angry about the Obama administration changing their goal from being zero enrichment, which was totally unacceptable to the Iranians who are a non-weapon signatory to the nuclear non-proliferation treaty, you know, being told that they can have zero enrichment. Since then, the U.S. has shifted to a position of demanding limited enrichment, which is what we're seeing in this political framework. So what I'm saying is I think that it's a change in the American demand that has allowed Iran to engage more proactively in this. And the historical facts over the past, you know, eight years or so suggest to me that the sanctions have not worked. And kind of switching to another issue that both uh, sides have to deal with. In regards to Yemen, the country is basically in a civil war. The institutions of Yemen have basically been disintegrated. You have this fight going on with AQAP, the Houthis, and then you have the Saudis intervening. And now the Houthis are apparently backed by Iran, the, the extent of which is not really known. And in Iraq, you see the Iranian influence that was seeping through, especially during their civil war. What does Iranian influence in the Middle East bode for the area and Western nations? Sure. So in the case of Yemen, this is being presented mostly as a sectarian war between Sunnis and Shia. And I think the reality is more complex than just that. Uh, It's being presented as basically like Sunnis and Saudi Arabia versus Shia and Iran. And and that's not quite the case. I think a lot of the roots of this have to do more with the localized conflict. This Houthi rebellion has been going on for a very long time. And the Houthis previously ruled Yemen for a few centuries. So they're not new to this power struggle that's taking place place in Yemen. The complexity of this conflict in Yemen also has to do with the Saudi involvement through the Arab coalition forces and the recent airstrikes. So the Saudis have very clearly, I mean, in no equivocal terms, have taken clear sides on who it is that they support in this conflict. So I think rather than talking about the implications of Iran's role in the conflict, more important to think about what the implications of Saudi Arabia's role in the conflict are. Uh, In terms of Iran's involvement, if any, in this conflict, I think it's probably very limited. First, you know, in terms of a sectarian affinity, the Zaydis are theologically different than the Shia of Iran, which are primarily 12-er Shia. So the Zaydis, which is the type of uh, Islam that the Houthis follow, really only acknowledge the first five imams, whereas Iran's Shias acknowledge 12 imams. So there is a big difference there, and theologically, they're really not the same. So in that sense, yeah, I don't think that Iran has this religious affinity for them necessarily. But, I mean, it is possible that they are financially helping them or advising them uh, militarily. I'm not exactly sure the extent of it either. But, uh, yeah, it would be cautious to present it in just uh, sectarian terms. Even the same in with ISIS in Iraq. We're, some people are seeing ISIS as this Sunni versus Shia split, but actually a lot of who ISIS are killing are Sunnis rather than Shia. And these were the moderate opposition to the government, and many of whom are Sunnis. Also, I mentioned um, Iranian influence in Iraq, how that um, affects the region. Right. And what does that yeah. also mean for Western nations? Well, uh, in Iraq... I think that obviously Iran is engaged right now. They're engaging in airstrikes and advising these Shia militias in Iraq. And obviously, you know, this has to do with a a long relationship that they've had with their neighbor on their western border. But in terms of where it's going to go, you know, in the coming months and years, I think that has a lot to do with how ISIS morphs. You know, what does ISIS become in the next few months? So, If ISIS becomes less of a problem, this issue is mitigated to some extent, then I think that Iran is not going to get more involved in that particular theater. If it does intensify and it becomes more of a problem, then we may see Iran increase the measures it's taking in order to fight ISIS. Uh, I think another factor to consider there is also what does the central government in Iraq want, because I think that everything that Iran is doing because of their close relationship with the, with the Iraqi government, is being done in close communication and some coordination with the Baghdad government, uh, which has basically greenlit to the Iranians to be involved in this fight against ISIS. So I think it will really depend on you know what happens to ISIS, and that'll determine what Iran's response will be, as well as what is it that the Baghdad government hopes to see from Iran. 
All right. Well, thank you, Kayvon. I hope that um, my questions and your answers uh, help clear up this uh, situation uh, that the Iranian influence in the Middle East is not as simple as just a simple uh, Sunni versus Shia conflict. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you for tuning into this week's episode of The Global Current. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. I'm Dominique DiMarzio. And I'm Alex Krause. We'll We'll see see you next week. week.